Oh, there are a lot of you out there. Good evening. It is so good to be with you. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for that nice introduction. And I just have to say, it is very good uh, to be with you all here tonight, to be here celebrating the work of an organization that is doing so brilliantly the kind of think and act and conversation changing work that we need uh, so much on the left in both of our countries and globally, as my remarks tonight will make clear. I only wish that I'd run those remarks through Charlie <laughs> beforehand, uh, but live and learn. Uh, anyway, uh, Sharon's uh, Shannon's report gave us a lot to cheer about, and to that, let me add the hearings now underway in my own country. <laughs> Americans are making up our holiday gift lists, and <laughs> you hear people starting to sing, all I want for Christmas is impeachment. <laughs> uh, so for good people everywhere, it is absolutely thrilling to see Donald Trump finally being held accountable for something in a serious way. His presidency, as we know, has given heart to bullies and tyrants the world over, uh, and given rogue corporations, and particularly fossil fuel corporations, so much of their wish list in so few years. So it is nice to see some comeuppance. And as believers in public sector who know that government, when it is good, is all of us doing together what we cannot do alone, watching the parade of committed public servants speak truth with courage has been heartening and inspiring. All of this, like our 2018 elections and your recent federal elections, supports uh, and suggests the idea that the momentum may be shifting our way, as Cecilia so beautifully suggested. Yes, I do believe that. And yet, <laughs> and yet, no matter what comes of the impeachment inquiry in the US and even what comes of the 2020 election, the work of organizers and activists will remain, will remain absolutely critical to shaping the future. Because as I think people in this room understand tonight, Donald Trump is but the strange fruit of a problem that runs much deeper an assault on democracy that has been decades in the making by a billionaire-funded radical right, without which a figure, frankly, as debased as Donald Trump would never have gotten the power that he has. I refer, of course, to the subject of my remarks tonight, which is the cause convened by Charles Koch, one of the richest men on the planet, uh, and uh, uh, underwritten by the network of like-minded donors that uh, billionaire and multimillionaire donors, in fact, that Charles Koch has gathered and the vast apparatus they have funded that is making quiet war on collective power and democratic governance. And thanks to Donald Trump's gift for changing the conversation with his daily outrages, they have been able to advance that project all but unnoticed for almost four years now. Tonight, I'll share with you uh, some of what I found uh, in my research, what I've learned about, uh, about this quiet transformation that is underway that Donald Trump's conduct distracts our attention from. First slide. Uh, and that is an ingenious, Slo Oops, second slide, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that first one. Um, these figures would all be changed, except I think Mike Pence, since you know there's uh, some churning, as we might say, in the Oval Office. Uh, but anyway, what I want to talk about is a quiet transformation underway that uh, Donald Trump's conduct distracts our attention from. And what I'm referring to is an ingenious, slow takeover by the Koch-led radical right of core branches of our government uh, in the United States, starting at the state level after the 2010 midterms that many people uh, sat out thinking elections didn't really matter, uh, and then uh, moving on to the federal courts, Congress, and the executive branch, 
with assistance from an infrastructure of hundreds of organizations. Next slide, please. Uh, hundreds of organizations funded oops, uh, by these billionaire and multimillionaire donors mm -hmm. who seek to make our country, and in fact the wider world, as I'll explain, to seek to remake our country uh, by stealth. And I'll explain as I go on what I mean by stealth. But this anti-democratic infrastructure that these donors fund now includes dozens of ostensibly separate national organizations. They include some you may have heard about, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Federalist Society. Uh, they also include over 150 state-level organizations whose work is aligned through something called the State Policy Network. Um, there are three of those in my state of North Carolina alone. Also includes organizing enterprises, including Americans for Prosperity, Concerned Veterans for America, the Libre Initiative aimed at Latinos, and Generation Opportunity aimed at young people. Also includes colleges uh, uh, or centers at colleges and universities with George Mason University, which I wrote about as the flagship, but faculty at over 300 universities in the US now getting funding and at least McGill University uh, in Canada. It also includes a uh, transnational network called the Atlas Network. Next slide. Please, uh, the Atlas Network, you can look up the directory online. Canada actually has 13 uh, affiliates of the Atlas Network, including the Fraser Institute here in British Columbia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good, get them in your crosshairs. I think we could do some work on them. Uh, now, future historians are going to look back on our era, I know, and tell the inspiring story of the 11th hour organizing from so many people in so many different domains that stymied the billionaire's bid for control, right? I am absolutely certain as I listen to the folks in this room, like so many rooms that I've been in over these last uh, few years, and I know that they are not going to win. We are on to them, we are figuring this out, we are going forward. But at the same time, I think if those future historians are honest, they are going to have to acknowledge and write about um, the genius of the Coke long game that almost succeeded. They'll trace how its quiet focus on trying to destroy the strongest barriers to the Koch project, teachers unions top among them, so I'm delighted to see that there are teachers unions here tonight who have been so important in leading the fight in my own country. They will trace how the Koch's efforts to destroy the power of their, their strongest opponents while also radically altering the rules of the political process wherever they get power, together enabled the progression of this project, of this stealth takeover, to the point we see today, which no one in America or elsewhere would have imagined possible in 2008. And I know there are many people who in hindsight look back on the Obama presidency, uh, feel disappointment, but, but let me say this. Go back for a moment in your heads to 2008 or to the inauguration in January of 2009 and remember the sense of collective power, of achievement, of exhilaration, of hope that that election signified. Then think about what has happened in the decade since then. That is the measure of the achievement of the cause that I'm here to talk about tonight. My research exposes how the right managed what it has done and why. And it explains what the end game of all of this is and what it will mean for the overwhelming majority of people who will be devastated if this Koch project succeeds. Because the ultimate agenda of all of this is much more radical uh, than people know, as you'll realize as I go on. To say, take just one index of this, the Koch network is now the top source of funding for climate denial in the United States. And I suspect if we looked at a world scale, we'd find them uh, there too.
Now, I don't want to summarize the narrative that anchors my book's arguments, actually how I came on to this story, because uh, I came on to it from the past, from studying something in the 1950s. But I will say this. The story in my book starts in late 1956, as the state of Virginia was leading the wider segregationist South in a policy that they called massive resistance, massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court desegregation uh, decision. That policy of massive resistance provided tax-funded vouchers for segregated private schools, segregation academies, they were called, that were beyond the reach of the courts because the Brown decision only affected public education. This massive resistance legislation, in addition to creating these vouchers in order to enable segregation as parents of not uh, great means to send their children away from the public schools, uh, this policy of massive resistance also required required the closure of public schools that planned to desegregate. And it, re, and it took away the First Amendment rights of the NAACP. And it forever weakened public education in the South. The um, slide that was up just a moment ago was actually how I came on to this research. It's the story of schools in Prince Edward County, Virginia, in the old tobacco plantation belt that shut down the public school system for five years in order to punish black students for having gone on a 100% solid strike for a decent high school in one of the cases that was folded into Brown. Uh, that's how I came into this story. We tend to remember that massive resistance fight as the last gasp of Jim Crow, but my research revealed that it was also the first big opportunity for the cause of free market fundamentalism that is roiling our world today. It turns out that the founders of the, liber the lib libertarian, neoliberal, call them what you will, the founders of this cause um, took advantage of the crisis in the South. They flocked to the state of Virginia's side, thrilled at the prospect of tax subsidies for private schooling. And I include here Milton Friedman and uh, Friedrich Hayek, for those uh, familiar with them, <laughs> those of us of a certain vintage. Uh, anyway, of that crucible in the South, in the, the last ditch fight to preserve segregated schooling, I will only say one more thing now. And that is that the author, Maya Angelou, was right when she wrote, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Because what we're seeing now, today, is not the first time that the libertarian right has shown a willingness to leverage white supremacy to advance an otherwise unpopular agenda. They did it back then in the 1950s when it most counted, and they will keep doing it until they are stopped. What I want to convey to you tonight, though, is not the story of the book, uh, but rather what I see as the value added of my research for people like you, people in uh, the uh, CCPA, for all the uh, other allies, communities, social justice workers, organizers, uh, labor union folks who are here tonight who are dealing daily with the impact of this kind of strategy that I stumbled on by chance in researching that 60-year-old fight. Uh, and that has been hardwired, in fact, into global neoliberalism. I'll state my case plainly, and that is that the right has been winning over the last decade in my country, but not only there, uh, because, uh, winning like never before, because the Koch network has effectively weaponized the ideas of a figure who is little known to most people, but who supplied the crucial ideas that are in play on the political right now, much as Milton Friedman's ideas were in play in an earlier era. Next slide, please. Uh, this figure's name was James McGill Buchanan. He was the first US Southerner to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences 
for work he started during the social, uh, Southern Schools crisis. And that's actually the, the phrase that he used for his effort to abet this school privatization, letting the chips fall where they may. Uh, he developed a new school of thought that he won the prize for, um, and it was called Public Choice Economics. He built it as a science that was providing an economic analysis of politics. But the real mission of this approach I found in the archives, not least in his letters to donors, uh, was uh, to discredit government action, to discredit government action so that there would be no trusted alternative to rule by the market, and thus to shield the so-called makers from the so-called takers, right, in the language of today's political right. Or as Buchanan put it, to shield the productive from the parasites. This is language he used in his scholarship. Uh, so, today's political right, I learned, is using a playbook derived from Buchanan's ideas to undermine the progressive power on which progressive policy depends, and then to rig the rules in their own favor at every step. As Charles Koch put it with delight to a donor summit last year, and I quote, we have made more progress together over the last five years than I was able to make over the previous 50. By following these ideas from their origins in civil rights era of Virginia to the present, I think we gain at least three important resources. First, we gain a deep understanding of the Koch Network's operational strategy. This is a complex, integrated, long game, uh, and knowing about it, I think, also helps us better understand how that strategy might be blunted. Second, we gain a history that exposes why the radical right, this radical right, adopted a stealth strategy. And that was precisely because its architects knew that the majority would stop their plan if people became aware of where this was all coming from and where, in fact, it is heading. And I honestly believe that is the single most important finding of my research, is to see the architects of all of this explaining, saying again and again in their own words that they recognize that they are a permanent minority cause and that the people don't want the program they are trying to put into place. Third, we gain knowledge of the ultimate end game of this radical libertarian project. They wisely don't announce that end game to the rest of us because it is an incredibly radical transformation of our governing institutions, our legal systems, and frankly, our ethical norms. Its purpose is in time to force, to impose total personal responsibility on the people. It would do that by undercutting our capacity to do the kinds of things that citizens for generations have come together to look to government for help with. From public education and public health measures to retirement security, anti-discrimination laws, environmental protection, and more. Next slide, please. And you can get a, oops. Okay, so that's Buchanan and Koch. Next slide, please. There you go. Uh, there, there's some of the agendas that they're not exactly um, announcing. So in short, the Koch donor network and their operatives seek to enchain democracy. That, by the way, is a phrase I borrowed from Buchanan. Uh, the plan is, over time, to bind our political process in such a way as to make government unable to comply with the will of the people, at least as the will of the people involves tax transfers and regulation. And I think the folks at CCPA can tell you that that's just about everything that government does, right? So what we're seeing, it is really important to understand, is much more than partisan. This is not, at the end of the day, about D's versus R's. It's not about liberals versus conservatives. This is a different ball game. It is a messianic plan, decades in the making, to fundamentally change the relationship between the people and government, and to do so permanently in a manner that aims to pin the proverbial pendulum to the right so that it cannot swing back again. To grasp why having this plan of action matters, let me quote a top uh, Koch lieutenant, a man named Mark Holden, 
gloating to a donor summit in late 2015. He said this, we're close to winning. They don't have the real path. He was referring to critics of the Koch network, but he might have been talking about the rest of us. Through serendipity, I found that path through my research. It starts with gaining control over an ever-growing number of states, now 30. It then moves through those state legislatures to alter the rules of the political process in each one. And by the way, my adopted state of North Carolina is one of those states, so I watched this up close, and that's how I came to really understand it. Uh, it moves through those state legislatures, altering the rules of the political process in a manner that is also designed, ultimately, to choke progressive national policy, too. Among the most pivotal changes are these the most radical and sophisticated gerrymandering, that is redistricting, we've ever seen in our political history in order to enable minority rule, hamstringing labor unions, especially teachers unions, which in today's America are the most powerful uh, and the most progressive, Under <laughs> undermining other strong liberal lobbies, such as Planned Parenthood, then, with these core defenders of democracy weakened, the strategy moves to the next phase with voter suppression, privatization of public goods to alter power relations, preemption of by state legislatures of local progressive wins. I don't know if your provinces can do that to your cities, but that can be done in the US and it is being done. Undermining the independence of the judiciary in the states and more. So what is this real path driving towards? the ultimate radical rules change, altering the US Constitution at the first and only state convened constitutional convention in American history since 1787, when the Constitution was drafted. The goal of this project, as advised by Buchanan, is to amend the Constitution in a manner that would curtail most of what progressive social movements have accomplished not just since the 1960s, not just since the 1930s, going back all the way to the 1910s with things like the progressive income tax. This may sound exaggerated. It may sound impossible. You may be thinking, why did they bring this crazy woman? Uh, but it is, in fact, happening. The organization Common Cause, which you may have heard of, Common Cause calls this Article 5 convention effort the most serious threat to our democracy, flying almost completely under the radar. Next slide, please. And here's the sad thing. I won't go into this story here, but I tell it in chapter 10 of my book. It was moving to hear that Cecilia has uh, family in uh, Chile. Um, this has been tried, this kind of constitution of locks and bolts. It's been tried in Chile. And over the last several weeks, there have been tens of thousands of people out in the streets, young people getting blinded by so-called rubber bullets. Uh, and people, I, last death toll I heard was 18. The key thing that has got people outraged, the subway fares were the prompt. It is this so-called constitution of liberty that Buchanan was called in to advise on that means even super majorities of the Chilean people cannot achieve their will through the political process. And consider this. While the eyes of journalists and citizens in the US have been fixated uh, for the last several years almost exclusively on Washington and on Donald Trump, a man that I now think of as the distractor in chief, Organizations and elected officials funded by Charles Koch and this donor network with ALEC that you've heard of in the lead have been quietly lining up authorizations from states, that, uh, state authorizations needed to call such a convention. They now have in place 28 of the 34 states needed to convene a constitutional convention. Some background, Article 5 of the US Constitution provides two routes to amendment. The first one is the one that has produced 27 amendments, goes through Congress, then goes out to the states for ratification. It also includes, thanks to the slaveholding states, the option of a convention called by two thirds of the states. This has never been tried because it is so radical. There are no guardrails in, the, in Article 5 for this. So any convention, by definition, would be a runaway convention, a sure-fire way uh, to um, uh, get what the right wants. 
So what kind of a country would the libertarian dream constitution create? James Buchanan actually laid this out more than once. It would look a lot like America in 1900, a place where workers had no legal right to organize for collective voice, a place where corporations were free of democratic ability, whether for discrimination or pollution or consumer protection, needless to say, a place of mass voter suppression, and a place with no Social Security or Medicare uh, and more. The vision is so reactionary that to quote common cause again, it seeks to roll back the 20th century. But here we hit yet another puzzle because even the voters who have been so loyal to the current president would not want to live in the, such a country. Remember those keep your government hands off my Medicare uh, uh, arguments at Tea Party rallies? So how exactly could the Koch-led right carry out this kind of transformation in a at least somewhat functional democracy? This, I think, is where my research actually brings uh, something unique to the table. Because the operational strategy I found that uh, Koch and his field generals have come up with to surmount this rather considerable obstacle depends on stealth. Again, why stealth? Because they know that people would not want uh, these changes. So it proceeds through a series of what Koch himself has called interrelated plays. These are incremental changes that build on uh, one another in a cumulative manner so that this cause never has to inform the people of the true end game or even be honest about the true purpose of each play that moves the overall project closer to its destination. Koch himself puts the method this way, and I actually think it's a useful metaphor to understand all this. He says, he was referring to his business enterprise, but they're totally fused since it's a privately held corporation uh, and they work together. I often think of what we do as stonemasonry. Once a stone has been carefully selected and set, it shapes a new space in which the mason can set yet another well-chosen cho stone. Each stone is different, but they all fit together to create a framework that is mutually reinforcing. To illustrate what he means by a well-chosen stone, perhaps you followed when Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker pushed through something called Act 10 to take away collective bargaining rights from public sector workers. That was the perfect first stone, dishonestly framed as a budget repair bill. Next slide, please. Whoops, I forgot libertarian ethics, but you can see that. Uh, okay, there's Scott Walker. Again, stealth is critical to all of this. Not just misinformation about the particular measures, but also disinformation is crucial to this strategy. So, climate science denial I have mentioned working with the tobacco industries, I industry in the 1980s to build up corporate uh, support for this project and blow smoke, if you will, into the public conversation about the dangers of tobacco. Also, the myth of voter fraud. This is also all careful, careful deliberate disinformation. Again, why? Because as Charles Koch himself said, when he launched this effort in earnest in the late 1990s, 1997 in fact, he said, since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. Next slide. What did he mean by superior technology? He was calling on his uh, grantees to apply. This is a very smart man, three engineering degrees uh, from MIT. When he talks about technology, he really means ideas. And he found those ideas in the school of thought developed by James Buchanan, a way of thinking that has since become widespread on the right, pushed out through their think tanks, put out into work by the organizing operations and so forth. It is widespread, but it is barely known on the left. One of Buchanan's greatest gifts to the right was this advice. He said, if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, stop focusing on who rules. Start thinking about the rules. Figure out how to change those rules in order to get what you want. 
Why was this so important to change the fundamental rules of the society? Because it's hard to believe for people of such great wealth and power, but they were feeling embattled. They were feeling desperate by the 1990s. They could see the future a future in which the corporate right was losing badly. With the Cold War over, even the Republican Party was talking about using the so-called peace dividend for domestic needs. I actually think George Herbert Walker Bush might have invented uh, that phrase, peace dividend. I'm not sure, but he definitely used it. There was also something called the Motor Voter Act pushed by a since disappeared group uh, called ACORN that brought low income voters into the political process by the millions in a finely inclusive electorate. There are also public sector unions working in sophisticated new ways uh, to build workers' power. And perhaps above all, for a corporation like Coke Industries, so deeply based in fossil fuels and dependent on that for its enormous income people were talking about global warming. And Republicans, as well as Democrats, were saying we needed to act on this profound threat. Both parties, obviously in different ways, but both parties were seeing the need for new government regulation of fossil fuel companies. That was when Charles Koch set out in earnest to transform government. In 1997, he gave his first $10 million to James Buchanan Center at George Mason University, where Koch is now the leading uh, donor, having given over $100 million. Uh, and George Mason University is now the academic base camp of this political enterprise. Koch made it clear with that first gift just how ambitious his vision was. He said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries. Clearly, <laughs> he did not understand that Columbus was not <laughs> something to uh, be celebrated in that way. In any event, we have all felt, um, oh, can I have another slide, please? Uh, we have all felt the force that he sought to unleash since then as the organizations and elected officials backed by this Koch network have engaged in systematic radical rules change that has brought us to the current crisis. We've seen that force in the transformation of one of our two major parties in the United States, the Republican Party, using rules changes and changing incentives to bend the party to the arch right donor demands, using primary challenges from the right against any candidate who doesn't toe the line and the lure of dark money cash for those who do. Another Koch official boasts of this, what they call the accountability play as our secret sauce. To let you know how powerful it is, uh, in the 1990s, there was no difference between the Republican and the Democratic Party in terms of their recognition that of the science of climate change, right? That the, the planet was changing, global warming was happening, differences in how to address it, but no differences on the science. By 2014, only eight of 278 Republicans in Congress would admit that climate change was man-made. That's how powerful this secret sauce is. If you're wondering why they're terrified of defying Donald Trump, it's not only its base, it's the donors too. The donors aren't speaking out against Donald Trump. He's doing quite a lot for them. So, um, and indeed, lo and behold, since the inauguration of President Trump, the Koch wish list has been granted with epic speed on almost every front, with the single exception of trade policy. Above all, in the Supreme Court appointments, in his appointments to the federal judiciary, and what is going on in every federal department and agency as the nation focuses on Donald Trump. Of that, let me share this. The Guardian uh, reported uh, a few months ago that one Trump administration official gloated at a meeting with oil and gas corporations saying this. One of the things I have found absolutely thrilling in working for this administration is the president has a knack for keeping the attention of the media and the public focused elsewhere 
while we do all the work that needs to be done on behalf of the people. And I loved Cecilia's counsel to slow down. Because in fact, if we disconnect a bit from that 24-7 news cycle and the outrage and, and visceral responses, uh, it incites and instead take a deep breath, look for the deeper patterns, we're going to see much better what we need to focus on. So along those lines, what does all I've been saying mean for the organizers and activists and committed citizens in this room? If we have this Coke battle plan, if we know where all of this is coming from, if we understand the real end game, if we know that this is now a transnational project, what are the action implications? I want to highlight just a few in closing. Because, in fact, people are getting wise. <laughs> and it is really exciting to see how much change has gone on among uh, progressives and, in fact, ordinary American citizens uh, in the last few years. You could look to the 28 midterms, in 2018 midterms, rather, in my country, a uh, promissory note uh, on all of this. Um, uh, I won't get into that in the interest of time. But, uh, but in terms of the takeaway, uh, one lesson I think that we can draw that's very important is that just taking stands on single issues, even big issues, like jobs or health care, is no longer going to work, at least in America, as it once did, because our political system has been so captured and uh, upended by the corporate right. Flowing from that, uh, another lesson is that democracy itself must become a key focus of every progressive cause's work. As Thank you. Thank you. And we have to alert the public to the profound danger that democracy is in. And in our case, not just from Donald Trump. As one reader of my book, a public health nurse, put it, I thought beautifully, I see now this presidency is the tumor, not the cancer. Clearly, you have to excise the tumor, but we must deal with the cancer. What is the cancer that has enabled this acute crisis? That is the chronic problems in American democracy that allowed the Koch project to get as far as it has. The escalating and unmatched inequality, the dark corporate money in politics, the obstacles to voter participation, the gerrymandering that lets elected officials choose their voters rather than voters their elected officials, the radical changes in legal rules and Supreme Court rulings and more. And as a specialist in the history of social movements who has studied this Koch plan and thought long and hard about all this, I will tell you this. I believe the only lasting way out of this acute crisis is deep structural reform of the operating rules of government. Again, what kind of reform? Reform to stop the flow of corporate money to candidates. Re Reform to bring more voters into participation. And here I can tell you, I think this figure is actually outdated. It was in my book. It's got to be worse now. But at the time my book was published um, uh, two years ago, and maybe it was a three-year-old figure, the United States was 138th of 172 democracies in the world in our rates of citizen participation. That is something to be ashamed of, right? Um, so that's what I mean by bringing more voters into participation and giving them reasons to vote, as some of our candidates now are, our presidential candidates, um, uh, like Bernie and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, rebuilding also countervailing power to extreme wealth like that of the Koch donor network, particularly union power, particularly collective people's power. Thank you. As some organizers are putting it now, we need to work on democracy beyond elections, on year-round enhanced organization and representation of the people. That is the only way out of this crisis. 
And as we mobilize, we have to also unrig these rules, all the rule rigging I talked about, but also things like the tax laws and the courts that these corporations have captured now uh, in such a significant way. It's a tall order, to be sure. I'm not understating that. But we can also say this. Um, History is full of fun ironies. I actually think of it as an antidepressant. I suppose it depends on what you study and how you look, but I study social movements. Um, and what this Koch network has done is they have tried to take away a shared progressive toolkit that we all took so much for granted we didn't even know we depended on it, right? Democratic, accountable government with the capacity of the people to organize collectively to make change. In their effort to take away that toolkit for, from all of us, they might have done for the rest of us what we have been so unable to do for ourselves, to make us realize how much we actually have in common and how deeply we need one another to preserve our shared values and victories and, in fact, our common planet. Thank you. So I know that I've delivered a rather bracing, <laughs> frightening message, but I actually end with hope because I think there is so much to justify it, not least the amazing young sustainability teams and their counterparts. And what we are starting to see in my country, in yours, around the globe with young people like these great heroic organizers uh, who are with us tonight is a spreading recognition that we are at a pivotal moment in history, a kind of all hands on deck emergency for democracy. That understanding crosses sectors. I've seen it among union members, uh, environmentalists, civil rights activists, good government groups, feminists, and retirees who worked hard to make a better world and will be damned if they will see it ruined for their grandchildren. You can see the sprouts of change everywhere now in my country in the Women's March that greeted the election of the current president, the gl biggest global mobilization of women and male allies in the world until the Young People's Climate March, I believe, uh, in the rapid growth of groups like Indivisible and Move On, in the public teacher, school teachers' mobilizations, first the Red for Ed, now these amazing city strikes that are getting huge public support, among the Parkland students, victims of gun violence who launched the March for Our Lives organizing, the reaction to family separations at the border, and you can see it in House Bill 1, a promissory note from House Democrats on the sweeping changes that we need that passed the House unanimously and has been endorsed by every Democratic U.S. Senator. I'm not here to trump at the Democratic Party, but they have put forward a piece of good legislation. Uh, and it will address many of these structural democracy reforms that I'm talking about. You can also see it in referendums that citizens are pushing forward in state after state. In 2018, democracy reform was on the ballot in 15 different states. It won in every single case. Amazing stories. The sense of urgency, this shared sense of urgency among all these people comes with a recognition that we cannot just keep doing the same things in the same way we had been and expect better results in the face of organized, determined, aggressive, right-wing wealth like this. We need to step up our game. We, too, must think much more long-term. We, too, must build power at the state level and the provincial level, in your case, and internationally uh, among all of us, not just work locally and nationally. We also have to work to change the national conversation about government and collective power and who we are as a people. And to do all of this well, we have to reach beyond our silos and make the alliances we need to reclaim the future for the vast majority. Because as the old adage goes, there is no crisis that is not also an opportunity. 
And right now, we have the opportunity of a lifetime, the opportunity to fix governments that have been badly broken for a very long time now, to take them, to mobilize, to come together across those silos and renew the promise of self-government. We are going to have to reform democracy to save it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. It's been a real pleasure to be with you. I'm honored. <laughs>